Thank you, Steffi. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure again to present to you one of the most liked speakers of DLD all over the world, Werner Vogel. Werner is the CTO of a small company you will be hearing about called Amazon. And let's go straight into the most important things, uh, Werner. This, we, this is supposed to be a fireside chat. OK. And we have about 19, 13 minutes. You know, we got seven minutes already gone. Uh, Werner, what is the number of rats in New York? 95 million. 95 million. How did you get to this number? Well, apparently, there's, so there's 8.6 million people living in New York City, and there's about 11 rats per inhabitant in New York. In New York. And yeah. It, and so the story came about, because that's, of course, more important. There was a presentation I gave probably 10, 15 years ago about sort of uh, teaching people about scale, you know, how big do things get? Because most people, when you think about Amazon, especially in the earlier days when people just follow your bookshop, didn't have any clue about the massive scale that was behind uh, the scenes and that we had to develop technologies that no commercial company could be selling to us. So we had to develop all these things. So thinking about scale and thinking about numbers, and one of the jokes I made is, uh, one of the numbers that came up, and that Joshi always remembered, is the number of rats in New York. Who, by the way, who speaks faster, Bill or Werner? <laughs> who think Bill speaks faster, raise your hand. <laughs> who think Werner speaks faster, raise your hand. <laughs> Bill, you have to, to do some improvement. <laughs> Werner, uh, how many years you are with Amazon? How many? Years, years. 25,000, I mean, 94 when Jeff started Amazon. And, and, and you have to remember that and this is one of the points I want to make always is that Amazon is a technology company. You know, I mean, most of us have always thought about Amazon as a retailer. But when Jeff started Amazon, th there was no e commerce. The whole thing didn't exist. And so he was fascinated by what you could do on the internet. He wasn't fascinated by a bookshop, but he just picked bookshop as, as, a, as a potential area. Because remember, a really good bookshop has about 40,000 titles in stock. Yet there's millions of books out there. And so there was something you could do on the internet that you couldn't do anywhere else. And it was sort of build a bookshop of all the books in the world. We still aren't there yet. We're getting there. But most importantly, these were things that in the very early days of the internet, people were thinking about. And Jeff was definitely a visionary about things that you could do in the internet that you could not do anywhere else. And that was the inception of, of Amazon. But and you are ev everything behind it is tech. Yeah? And you are, you are 25 years with Amazon? No, fifth, this is my 15th year. 15 year. I what, had more hair then. What, what, <laughs> was the, what was the sales? What were the sales in 15 years ago of Amazon? Uh, I, I don't remember. I don't sorry. remember. Okay, that's a good uh, answer. But, well, I can give you another number. When I joined Amazon, we had 15,000 employees. We now have 570,000. <laughs> and you know the names of each one of them? Absolutely, Yoshi. <laughs> and where, where, where this phenomena will continue to go? Um, well, I don't know. You know so the, the one thing is that if you go back to 97, when Amazon went public, uh, Jeff wrote a letter to shareholders. I think that's very, that's become very uh, famous because he lays out the principles of the company in, in there. And, and one of those principles is that um, if you want to build a long-term sustainable company, you have to align yourselves with your customers, not with your shareholders. Yeah? The idea being that you must be willing to cannibalize your company in exchange for very long-term success. So how do you build, the, things that Jeff always thinks about is, how do you build something that needs to survive yourself? Yeah, how do we build a company that 100 years from now is still there? And so that requires a very different thinking instead of, sort of thinking about short-term uh, capitalization or short-term re re results. It's all about aligning yourself with your customers because that's the only place where you're going to be successful in the long term. And this brings us maybe to the next issue, which I know which is near and dear to your heart. And this is how you create a very compelling product and how you create an irresistible user interface. <laughs> yeah, so, so I think one of the, some of the things that have happened um, in, in the past four or five years is a tremendous acceleration in terms of computational power with which we can do uh, machine learning. Uh, both automatic speech recognition, natural language understanding, text-to-speech. And we can do it in a way that almost mimics uh, the user, the, the, the interaction that we normally have among each other. Uh, remember, that w this is not a Slack channel, it's not a WhatsApp group. We're here, we're talking, uh, and as such, voice is such a natural way of interacting that 
um, that needs to become the natural interface to our digital systems. Mostly because it will unlock those digital systems for much larger parts of society. Yeah, a, a great story is, I mean, if you, if you give a, an iPad to your grandmother, the only thing she can do is actually hit the Skype button. But if you could talk to it, then that would be a completely different interaction. I've heard so many stories recently about people that are telling me that um, you know, their, their father or their grandfather died and the other partner is still over, and they love Alexa because they can talk to it all day. That has nothing to do, they, even though they had computers, that doesn't give you that normal human interaction. And I think most of the interfaces that we have until now have been driven by the capabilities of the machine, not how we want to communicate. Yeah, and, and, and there's so many examples, I think, around the world that shows that uh, voice is a, such a powerful uh, way of accessing digital systems. So there's a, there's a great story. One of the um, Amazon Web Services customers, so that's the cloud computing division of Amazon, um, is the International Rice Research Institute just outside Manila. And these guys know everything about rice. They've, what is it, 120,000 different strands of DNA of rice in their freezer. Rice. And, and F rice, rice, yeah. not mice, rice, yeah? Uh, <laughs> it's not a mice research institute, no. <laughs> um, so these, these, these guys know everything about it. So they build a system, because, so they target the poorest farmers in Southeast Asia um, with, support story, with support. So they build this system, a digital system, that farmers can explain how, what their patch of land looked like, and then they give advice about how much fertilizer to buy and when to apply it. Nobody used it. Why? Because they build it as a web-based system. None of these farmers have computers. They don't have smartphones. There may be one phone in the village. That's it. And so then they change it. They put a voice interface to it. Now, now farmers can call in, describe their patch of land in their local dialect. Machine learning goes off, comes back with an answer. And actually, the double scope yields and reduces uh, uh, fertilizer use by 90%. Yeah, so the power here is giving it a human-centric interface instead of a computer-centric one. And, and you know, as much as the success of the Alexas as home assistants and things like that are, are, are playing a bigger role in our life to, to, to today, it's much more important to start thinking about how do we build digital systems that have natural human-centric interfaces. And, and I, that's something that we're very, um, we're very proud of to actually have kicked this off once again as sort of a pioneering company. Um, and it's very interesting to see where we will go, especially thinking about this is just the first step. You know, uh, I think the old, old voice systems that we had in our cars is much more sort of command and control. Do this, you know, call that person, switch the radio to that. It's much more interesting to start thinking about how do, what's the psychology behind conversations? How do conversations evolve? Yeah, and how can we build digital systems that work with that? If you go, for example, now go to WebMD, to their, to their website, and you want to describe uh, sort of the, the illness that your kid has, you have to fill in a form. That's not how conversations work. You know, that's not how doctors work. I, I, and so go through a decision tree, work through that. And by the way, if your kid is ill, you're not being friendly to the machine. You know, you want to scream at it. And so there's so many emotions, there's so many parts that could become part of voice that is very exciting in building sort of the next generation of compute systems. By the way, you know, with all the pride you take about Alexa, I want to tell you that we Israelis preceded you. Of you course, ju you just, always. You, yeah, always, <laughs> that's true. You just made a very small improvement, you know, because for 3,000 years, <laughs> You've Jews, been talking. Jews were talking to the wall, you know, to the wailing wall. <laughs> the only thing you have done that it answered back. <laughs> Can I go, uh, as we always do, to two personal questions? Uh, try me, Joshi. Okay, how many, on average, how many kilometers you walk every day, roughly? Roughly? Um, about mm, eight to nine. Eight to nine? Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah, it's about, I think, according to this thing at least, I uh, so 12,000 steps, in, if it's my stride, it's about eight to nine kilometers. Eight to nine times 365 gives me Oh, look at that. I could 3,000 kilometers a year. Wow, wonderful, huh? That's good. How, how did that happen? Next question, how much, <laughs> how much beer you drink a year? Actually, actually, I don't really, I, I, if I have to, I'll drink beer, but you know. But roughly. It, it, in reality, I don't know, you know. Give me an est uh, estimate. Uh, actually, I haven't drunk any beer this year yet. You haven't drunk any beer. Because I'm trying to figure how much kilometers you are doing per liter. <laughs> <laughs> but you are not helping me. No, 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 no. You could try maybe other drinks or something like that. But <laughs> okay, let's go back to let's go back to 
to Amazon. You heard the forecasts of, uh, of Galloway. I know that you cannot make any forward looking statements because you are public company, but do you agree with him about the future of health in the tech uh, companies? Um, do, I, do I agree with him that this is the biggest problem that we're facing in the US and Maybe probably the around, around the world? And, and whether uh, we need to have, find alternative solutions to instead of the, 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 the total control that is happening right now by the insurance companies. Absolutely. I mean, uh, he, he referenced the, uh, the collaboration we have with, with JP Morgan and Berkshire. Berkshire. And that's really, if we look at the healthcare cost of our own employees, that's rising. It's incredible. It's, it's impossible that sort of these costs are getting to that level without getting the service that we So it's just an exploratory effort. You know? And, and as I said earlier, you know, as a stand-up comedian, you can make these kind of uh, uh, predictions. Whether they are reality is a very different story. <laughs> okay. Do I think do I think this is a, an area where uh, you know many uh, private companies will start looking for solutions for their employees? As I say, with 570,000 employees, you look at this yeah, problem very what? differently. What, what, you know, what came from between the lines that may be that you are using the employees uh, to, to start, not the employees, but you are using it to start getting into this space and eventually it will uh, expand? Right. So you can try and trick me in any way you want, Joshi, but I'm not going to give you a different answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Where do you see Amazon 10 years from today? 10 years from today? Um, I don't know. It's, if I look back 10 years, uh, would I have predicted where we are now? Probably no. not. No, not at all. So I think um, we Jeff always looks for new opportunities to, uh, to, to engage. I think we are, we are builders, we're experimenters. Again, if you go back to this uh, the letter to shareholders in 97, where Jeff lays out the principles of the company, the first one is all about the long term. The second principle is that we will continuously experiment. Yeah, and experiment, measure, learn. And the whole idea is that uh, experiments are not an experiment if you already know the outcome. Yeah, there needs to be high levels of uncertainty in sort of the experiments that you do. And um, each of our teams is charged with innovation and small uh, uh, experiments, and they can do this without actually top-level control. Um, and, and some of our experiments are going to be require massive capital investments, and those are often big, bold bets, meaning that if they are successful, they're going to be hugely successful and have massive impact on our balance sheet. That's the goal of these big, big bets. So whether that was AWS as the cloud computing or yeah. fulfillment by Amazon or Amazon Prime, all of these require significant capital investments with the idea that if they will be successful, they will be hugely successful. And at the same time, we've done some other things that prominently failed. You know, if you look at the phone that we built, it's not necessarily a great su success story. You know? And so as such, experimentation requires you to move fast. And, and for example, one of the principles behind this is that you can start experimenting, start doing these experiments without having access to 100% information. Why? Because often the last 20% of the information that you need is very hard to get by. There's probably some Pareto law that says 80% of the work goes there. Yeah. But most decisions that you make are two-way doors meaning that you can reverse them. And if you're conscious of that, you can change your mind. Yeah? And I think uh, what great business leaders do is not get stuck in their own re re religion and get stuck there, but be able to change your mind. So what you will see is that Amazon will sort of change over the coming 10, 10, 10 years, because we're willing to change our mind based on what we encounter along the road. Now, definition of divorce, right? Now, uh, <laughs> Now, you, can change you, are, you are now 500... Well, look, it's, it's, you can backtrack from that, can't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 560,000 employees, you said. 570,000. I think that was... 570,000. Well, yeah. We, so we, I would say it's a quite, uh, quite big company. Yeah. How do you, you keep innovating, innovating in such a huge company? To, to make sure that uh, hierarchy doesn't get into the way. I think hierarchy is absolutely unnatural. Yeah, if hierarchy actually drives, if people actually become part of the hierarchy, functioning in the hierarchy becomes more important than the kind of things that you deliver. So you do decentralization. So you Remember, have Jeff no, no, and 570? <laughs> well, actually, let me, let me tell you this. So look at nature. Yeah? There is, you have monkeys and a head monkey. Yeah? There are no lieutenant monkeys. Yeah? And so it's very natural. If you really want to I move fast... i tell you fast, why, because all of them moved into U uh, US corporate. <laughs> 
Most importantly, I think, is that um, hierarchy shouldn't become the inhibitor. You have hierarchy as a structure, uh, a limited flat. We try to keep the hierarchy as flat as possible. Hire people that want to be independent, that want to be owners, and actually really uh, move all your decision making to the edge. And where it's most important that these teams are able to be independent and fast moving. In, in exchange for that, you get some downsides, you get duplication, but most importantly is to continue to move fast. And even at the scale of Amazon, we're able to do this because we give the power in the hands of our employees to actually make their own future. And so you hire that kind of people, and as such, you get a very fast moving company that can continue to experiment and continue to innovate for years to come. Well, uh, unfortunately, our time ran, but there will be a second part to this talk, which will take place exactly 365 days from today. <laughs> so come to the second part of this discussion. <laughs> Werner, thank you very much, like always.